Hi, I'm Mimi Gerges. Over the course of two months, more than 600,000 Rohingya Muslims streamed into neighboring Bangladesh, fleeing Burma's security forces. Their children have been slaughtered in front of them. Their families have been killed. Maybe they have been raped. They say that the Rohingya have been reincarnated from snakes and insects. So when you do kill them, you're actually killing vermin, you're not killing human. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. Both the UN and Secretary of State Rex Tillerson have called attacks against Myanmar's Rohingya minority ethnic cleansing. Tillerson said, quote, these abuses by some among the Burmese military, security forces, and local vigilantes have caused tremendous suffering. After a careful and thorough analysis of available facts, it is clear that the situation in northern Rakhine State constitutes ethnic cleansing against the Rohingya. Here to discuss the situation is Azim Ibrahim, He's the author of The Rohingyas, Inside Myanmar's Hidden Genocide. And joining us by Skype from London is Shafur Rahman, a documentary filmmaker. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Azim, um, before the latest crisis this past summer, I had never heard of the Rohingya. Who are they and how long have they been living in that part of Myanmar? The Rohingya are a minority ethnic group that live in the Rakhine district of Myanmar. They have been described by the United Nations as the most persecuted minority in the world. Uh, one of the difficulties that the Rohingya have is that uh, you know they have faced wave after wave of violence over the last half century. Actually, goes back quite considerable some time. Uh, the violence that they faced. They are not just the most persecuted minority. They've also been described as the most friendless minority in the world because nobody has really heard of their plight. When I first started researching this book, you know, it was, it was very difficult to come across any information on the Rohingya, which is essentially why I put the book, uh, book together. Um, uh, they number about 1.2 to 2 million. The precise number is not actually known because they officially don't exist because they're also amongst the largest stateless people around the globe. And over the last 100 days, we've seen, you know, um, the majority of them, 646,000 by the latest estimates, being forcibly ethnically cleansed into neighbouring Bangladesh. So the Burmese are saying, look, these people are illegal aliens, they don't belong here, they've never lived here, they're really Bengalis, so they should just go back to Bangladesh. Well, this is one of the misnomers that I try to tackle in my book. I try to look into the veracity of these claims that the Rohingya are actually, uh, uh, you know, they're not really from Myanmar, they're not from that region. And uh, it's, it's very strange because the, the Burmese authorities, the Myanmar authorities, they believe that this term Rohingya is actually a manufactured term, that these people are all illegal immigrants that came over from Bangladesh in the 1940s and 1950s, and they created this term called Rohingya to give themselves an identity. So it's one of the things I try to do in my book is to examine the veracity of these claims. And I dug up documents from the Indian National Archive, some of them dating back to the time when it was British Burma when it was a British colony, when the British had actually done surveys. There was one particular civil servant called Charles Patton who had done an extensive survey of the region in 1824 and 1826. And I published all of these documents in my book so that really, clearly demonstrate the word Rohingya, that these people were Rohingya. So these people in particular have been there. Even if they weren't, this doesn't justify what's been happening to them. But they're, um, ethnically, they look um, Southeast Asian. That's they right, look. Yeah. And they speak a different language than the majority Burmese. That's right, yeah. And this is why there's persecution against them, because they have a different language, a different religion, they have different features, and uh, they, they just look different. Um, uh, the border between Myanmar and, and Bangladesh was never a hard border until the, the British actually came. Uh, it was very, a very loose border between, you know, up to Chittagong, sometimes the Burmese Empire went up, up to Chitta Chittagong, and sometimes it reverted back. So it was a very loose border, and so the people between the two areas share their ethnicity and their languages. But why the hatred of these particular people? Because it seems widespread among the Burmese people. Um, even the monks, the Buddhist monks, uh, are agitating against them. Yeah. Well, the hatred against the Rohingya can be traced back to the Second World War when the Japanese invaded what was at that time British Burma. The majority Buddhist population sided with the Japanese invaders, believing that they would be victorious and this would lead to swifter independence, whereas the minority Rohingya population stayed loyal to the British colonial masters. So after the country became independent, there was bad blood between the two people. But despite that, there was relative calm up until 1962 when there was a military coup 
by one general called Nay Wayne, who then undertook a programme, what he called the Burmese Road to Socialism, which was a complete economic disaster. So he did what a lot of military dictators do in that situation when things start going wrong, is that they try to find scapegoats to whom blame they can blame the ills of society. And the Rohingya minority who looked different, different religion, there was already bad blood between the two people, they were looked at with suspicion, were the perfect minority for this. So Azim, in that same speech by Tillerson that I talked about in the introduction, he said this, quote, no provocation can justify the horrendous atrocities that have ensued. So let's talk about that provocation, the, the thing that kind of set things off. This happened on August 25th. So on August 25th, there was an attack by a militant group called the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army. This is a Rohingya militant organization. It left about a dozen security officials dead. And in response to that is what the Myanmar authorities said, that they were undertaking clearance operations. But I think that the evidence demonstrates that the Myanmar authorities were actually planning this for some time. I actually wrote a piece, for example, in Newsweek in December of last year, stating exactly that, that the, the whole region is being militarized. Uh, to undertake a massive ethnic cleansing operation. Another thing that the Burmese tell you is that these Rohingya are militant Islamists. They're preparing for jihad. They're bringing in weapons. They're being supported by, you know, Wahhabists in Saudi Arabia or foreign uh, terrorist organizations. Is there any evidence of that? There's no evidence at all. Obviously, the, there's a militant organization that's undertaken these attacks. Uh, that organization does not have a lot of traction amongst the Rohingya people. They're relatively small. They're very poorly armed. You know, I've watched all of their militant videos. And even within the videos, you know, videos that are supposed to demonstrate strength and power, um, uh, a handful of guys holding Kalashnikovs, the rest of them have got bamboo sticks and knives, most of them are bare feet, so they're not a very serious organisation as such. But this idea that they're trying to impose an Islamic state seems to have gathered traction amongst the militant Buddhists. Uh, Shafour, I want to ask you um, about evidence that you might have seen or uncovered that the Burmese military and security forces were actually planning this attack against the Rohingya before the August 25th uh, attack by the mil militants? We see that on August 24th, the Burmese claim that um, ARSA carried out a number of attacks. Firstly, they haven't actually provided to international observers any evidence to that effect. Secondly, we see militarization, as Azim as said, throughout 2017, indeed since October 2016. Towards the end of July, and beginning of August, we see troop mobilization, troop deployment across Rakhine State. And what's also interesting is that you'd expect the Burmese to launch attacks against those areas where the 32 check posts were. Well, we see that the Burmese were ready and prepared to launch attacks, not just in those 32 areas, but across Rakhine State. And they were ready and deployed and some of them had been there for two months. We also see that various uh, clearance operations had been taking place in early August in any case. So, so a number when, of when you say clearance operations, what are you talking about? What did they actually do when they rolled into Rakhine State? For example, in certain villages, what you would see is the military making life difficult for citizens to survive in those villages. So these villages would be taking to the hills, would be taking to the nearby woods. They'd be coming in, creeping in to their villages to perhaps get pots and pans or rescue some uh, uh, household item. And they would live like this for two, three months. There were villages in Buthidong, there were villages in Mongdo, uh, where villages, this is the kind of life that they led uh, a few months before the attack to make life difficult, to make things so difficult that people would leave. And indeed, people were trickling into Bangladesh before August the 25th. Shafir, you had made a film about a massacre in a Rohingya village called Tula Tuli. What happened there? What, what did the survivors tell you? On 30th of August at 8 a.m. in the morning, people were suddenly uh, attacked by the military. They entered through the north of the village. This is a small village consisting of five hamlets. The military attacked from the north side of the village. And interestingly, the chairman of the village told everyone to gather at the riverbank. He said everything would be fine. The military would simply torch your homes 
but you would be left alone. The military not only torched the homes, but they went straight for the people as well. Various estimates, they're in fact conducting a study, not a study, a survey rather, as I speak, of the number of people killed uh, in Tulatuli, but their estimates range from between 1,500 and 1,700. But what's particularly uh, uh, noteworthy here is the savagery with which this operation was conducted in Tulatuli. They were killing not just the men, the women, children, burning their bodies, raping women. In my film, you'll see an example of one mother who had four children with her and her husband, and she was at the river bank, as I explained. Her husband was shot dead. Uh, all the children witnessed this. She was kept at the river bank for some time and then dragged out. The youngest of the children was taken, snatched from her and thrown into a burning pyre and, and, the, and the child died. The three of the remaining children and the mother were then taken to a hut along with other women. In that hut, they were raped. Two of the children were knocked out. In fact, all three were knocked out, but one regained consciousness. And just before the entire uh, hut was set on fire, in fact, it was set on fire and the mother was, uh, the clothes were burning. The little girl managed to wake her mother up and rescue her and bring her out outside. So absolutely horrendous goings on. You can just imagine what, uh, what these children went through. So this isn't just a matter of, you know, you guys are illegal aliens, we want you out of our country, go back to Bangladesh where you came from, supposedly, but they want all of them dead, it seems. In certain places, and like Tula Tuli, I think the idea was to make sure that the Burmese left behind a memory, that it, they inflicted such trauma that no one would come back to that village. And in other places, as I explained earlier, the strategy was just to get people out. They'd burn the houses, get the people out, take their belongings, rape some women, but basically the idea was to uh, send them off. In Tula Tuli, it seems, it was rather special. They were told not to go. They were told that they would be safe. They were told that everything would be fine. Only their homes would be torched. But in fact, they went for the people. And not only the homes, but uh, the people were slaughtered. Azim Aung San Suu Kyi is called the de facto leader of Myanmar, I guess due to some political reasons mm -hmm. that she can't uh, technically hold office. But how much power does she have? Does she control the military? And can she call, could she have called this off? Well, Aung San Suu Kyi does not control the military directly. Um, uh, one of the reasons why there's been complete inaction from the West, both in the UK, Europe and in the United States, is actually because of her. A lot of Western leaders believe that she's heading a very fragile democracy. And if you put too much pressure on her, this would lead to the military reverting back to taking control. And that's something that nobody wants to see. Uh, they want to basically try to keep her in position. And I believe that argument is flawed, uh, you know, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, one of the questions I get asked very often is, why is this happening now? Why is this happening in 2017? Why didn't it happen before? And the reality is, is the military actually undertook a dry run of this uh, in 2016. In October 2016, they did the exact same thing. They attacked a number of villages, burning them down, expelling tens of thousands of Rohingya into Bangladesh. And the military chief lent three things from that. First of all, he learnt that Aung San Suu Kyi defends him in public. So the United Nations did a report, for example, that said 52% 52, 52 of the women had been raped. So the majority of women had been raped. And she said that this is fake rape. And the United Nations also said that this is ethnic cleansing. And she said ethnic cleansing is too strong a term to use for this. And uh, when they called for a commission of inquiry, she said that this will not be helpful. So he realised that Aung San Suu Kyi defends him in public. So she this is like a green light. This was a green light to the military. And she also became a lightning rod for international criticism. The second thing he learned is that the military became very popular. The military was very unpopular in Myanmar, which is what forced them to have elections in the first place, which Aung San Suu Kyi won with 80%. But after this, 
the military became see, they, they began to be seen as the defenders of Buddhist values, so they became very popular. And the third thing he learned is that despite all the ethnic cleansing and the evidence of rape camps and you know genocide and killing, that he still got a VIP invitation to Europe. Germany and Austria, for example, literally rolled out the red carpet for him. He went on a tour of armaments factories and bought weaponry for his military, preparing for this operation. But, but why is Aung San Suu Kyi not advocating for the Rohingya? There's an, the Nonetheless, these are people living in her country, even if she thinks that they're you know, illegal or squatters or, or whatever, this is still a human rights issue. Yeah, well, there's two explanations to that. First of all, Aung San Suu Kyi has evolved from being a peace campaigner into now a full-time politician. And she has simply made a political calculation that the Rohingya issue is simply not worth utilising any political capital over. It is not worth alienating the military and it's not worth alienating her base by defending a, a group of people who are extremely unpopular in their own country. Another explanation um, uh, you know, that I've come across, and I've interviewed a number of people about this, is that she actually believes in what the military is doing. She actually believes that Burma, Myanmar is a Burma Buddhist country that just happens to have these minorities within it. And she herself shares a lot of those views. And you can see that from some of her early writings, and you can even see it from her speeches today. But, but even so, the Buddhists are uh, by far the majority it's not like the Muslims are about to take over the country. Absolutely, but it's not just the Muslims, remember, that are victims of this. There's many other minorities. The Rohingya just happen to be the largest minority. Remember, every single minority has actually been at war with the central government since independence in 1948. These are some of the longest running civil wars in the world. It was because the majority of Buddhist people there believe that this is a Buddhist country. And to be, to be a Burmese, you have to be a Buddhist. And they've actually changed the constitution to actually reflect that, that only Buddhist can be loyal citizens to this country. So they're at war with many of the other minorities, the Karen, the Kachin, the Shan, all of them have been at, at, at war with the central government. So who has influence with the Burmese government? Is it, is it China? I, I mean, who can talk some sense into them? China is the biggest actor in the region. And one of the reasons why President Obama visited Myanmar in 2013, you know, to, for any country to get a visit from the President of the United States is a big deal. And then one of the reasons why he did visit the President is because they were fearful that as Myanmar opens up, it will fall under the sphere of influence of China. If China has access to Myanmar, they have access to the, in, the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean, thus surrounding India, which is a regional rival, and it'll change the strategic calculus of the region. So this large so this would be bad then if China came in and, and had influence in Myanmar. Absolutely, and, and China is the biggest investor but in Myanmar. But then this is what happens, Azim, is we, the United States, puts pressure on Myanmar saying, cut it out, this is wrong what you're doing. And then they say, well, forget it, we're just going to go into China's sphere of influence. And we know China doesn't care about human rights. Absolutely, and this is exactly what's happening. China is now the biggest investor in Myanmar um, uh, by far. And, uh, you know, Myanmar is now falling under the sphere of influence of China. So when you have large geopolitical machinations going on behind the scenes and you insert this minority group who nobody's ever heard of, it simply does not fit into that calculation. You know, so nobody takes that into consideration. What about the Dalai Lama? See, this is a very interesting question because in Myanmar, the Buddhism that they follow is not the Buddhism of the Dalai Lama. Many of them don't recognize the Dalai Lama. A lot of them actually hate him. They believe he's a fraud. So this is a question I get asked very often is that how could Buddhists engage in such activity? How could Buddhists who, even when they have bad thoughts, they have to cleanse themselves? How can they possibly engage in this? And the reality is, is that it's a very different form of Buddhism that you and I may be familiar with. The Buddhism they follow is, sort of, is known as Theravada Buddhism, which is very militant in its nature. They actually believe that all other ideas ideologies and all of the minorities have to be kept in check for Buddhism to survive and Buddhism to thrive. So hence it fits into their ideology. And some of the monks, you know, the, all the speeches are, are available on YouTube. You can see them. One of them was on the cover of Time magazine, Ashin Wirathu. He referred to himself as the Buddhist Bin Laden. And you hear their speeches, they say that the Rohingya have been reincarnated from snakes and insects. So when you do kill them, you're actually killing vermin, you're not killing human. And there was another monk who's very closely associated with the military. He's like the patron of one of the regiments who said that raping Rohingya women is actually a moral duty for the soldiers. Wow. So historically, the Burmese military have been attacking the Rohingya. Um, how far back does this go, and why do you think the situation worsened 
once we had democracy or at least on the path to democracy in Myanmar. This has been going on for the, for about half a century now. The Rohingya have faced wave after wave of violence. The most recent wave is probably the worst that we've seen. This is essentially the final solution. And, it, and, and the reason why is because the reasons I articulated earlier is that the General Min Ong Ling, the army chief, believed that he can now get away with the final solution. He's in the perfect position now, the military is in the perfect position of having power without accountability. You know, the, the, one of the reasons why Western leaders don't want to put too much pressure is because they believe that it might be a military coup. And this is a myth that's being perpetuated by Aung San Suu Kyi and her supporters and friends. The military is actually in a very good situation. They have lots of power. They can get on with ethnic cleansing and, uh, and, and there's no international pressure. You know, and the military was very unpopular. And Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, they were forced to hold elections that brought her to power. So they they will not be in a they don't want to go to back to a position in which they become unpopular again and expose themselves. You know, Aung San Suu Kyi managed to get sanctions lifted off Myanmar and the military have enriched themselves. Now they cannot go back to a situation in which they will expose themselves to international sanctions and international scorn um, uh, you know, if if they undertake a military coup. Shafour, you have just been recently in um, with the refugees in Bangladesh. Do they feel that this is kind of the final solution? Do they feel like they can ever go home to Myanmar? Can they ever have feel like they can have security and safety there? Many of them have expressed without any shadow of doubt that they will never go back. They will not be able to go back because of what they've experienced there. Uh, they, the memories are far too painful. They're not uh, past the uh, trauma stages yet. I think um, they are fed up of being a political football in the country, in Bangladesh. They have very few rights there. They, um, they can't leave the camps. They're not recognized as refugees. Uh, they are, in fact, recognized as infiltrators. Um, I think they're very despondent about their situation. They are extremely suspicious of all talk about repatriation, which has been in the news recently. Uh, they ask, well, what, what are we going to go back to? They've burnt our homes. Um, are we going to these internally displaced persons camps, which uh, uh, Burma likes to set up, where people have uh, extremely uh, rigid restrictions on movement, access to medicine, access to education, etc. Uh, and also the history of repatriation is a, is a particularly dreadful one. Uh, in Bangladesh, when the people have been repatriated in in late 70s, uh, many people, in fact, Bangladesh made conditions very, very difficult. They they restricted food uh, to the camps, and I think about 12,000 people died, according to Human Rights Watch. And there were similar difficulties in 1991, 1992, when there were clashes, people died. And those who were repatriated, UNHCR could not trace them a few years later. And then again in 2004, when there was another wave of repatriation, again there were clashes, many people were injured uh, and uh, some people died. These were Is involuntary there any repatri hope that the perpetrators can be held accountable and, and that justice can be done? In Myanmar, if you look at their statements, in October, I believe the uh, Myanmar army conducted uh, their own analysis of what happened, their, their own evaluation. I think they said that uh, a bicycle had been stolen. Uh, they didn't really talk about the rapes, the murders, uh, the 75,000 people who came to Bangladesh. They talked about a bicycle that was stolen. They exonerated themselves recently as well over this latest wave of killings. But Shafur, not, what about uh, the International Criminal Court? I mean, can, can crimes against humanity uh, be brought against them? Well, there are, of course, efforts underway, but uh, what you have is international figures like Tillerson, who are not discussing this at all. They're saying it's uh, an ethnic cleansing issue. Ethnic cleansing does not really trigger any uh, legal uh, uh, obligations on the part of uh, United uh, Nations. Well, Shafour, uh, not, we... not to, not to uh, cut you off, but I, I want just to ask you one last question, which is what's the biggest need uh, of these refugees, both in the short term and in the long term? I think the biggest need that these refugees are, face, are facing, apart from, of course, shelter and food, 
uh, which is quite clearly uh, it's still an ongoing need and, and medicines, um, is the kind of trauma that they face and how to deal with it. These are, you can just imagine people walking around. These people have faced um, just the most horrendous uh, experiences in their lives. Their children have been slaughtered in front of them. Their, their families have been killed. Maybe they have been raped and so on. Uh, and this is not a society which is particularly, they're not going to go and seek help. And really door-to-door -door counseling is required. Uh, I have seen many people who are, you'd think, oh, well, perhaps nothing's happened to them. They're in that phase of denial that this has happened. They, it's so overwhelming that they are unable to cope with it. So I think one of the, you know, in this chaos, the first thing you want to do is sort out their food, sort out their shelter, and sort out their uh, the, these other immediate needs. But what's really hidden is... Uh, the trauma that these uh, people face in the camps. Well, I want to thank you both for being on the program. Thank you so much for bringing this uh, subject to our attention, and um, hopefully something can be done about it. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks so much. This has been the Mimi Gerges Show. You can see all of our programs on whut.org and YouTube. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter, and leave me your comments there. You can also subscribe to our podcast and listen anytime. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next time.